Hey, I'm Bill DeYoung, and this is the Catalyst Sessions. We're so glad you're here with us today. I'm so glad to be here with Roger Bartlett, who is a St. Petersburg musician with an incredible, incredible story to tell. And we're going to start off with uh, with the song. Here's Roger. Hey, man. Hey, man. Hey. Man. in your eyes Golden colors turn to red then to blue then to gray while the spirits of the night chase the light away at sunset sunset All right. Hey, welcome Roger Bartlett to the Catalyst. Thanks, Bill. Too. Great to be here. Thank you, my friend. Hey, man, you're from Shreveport. And uh, <laughs> Shreveport, uh, you know, holds a great place in my heart. Um, uh, musically, oh my God! Uh, tell us about your dad. Your dad was the announcer on the Hayride. He was the announcer on the Hayride, and and uh, he was a disc jockey on KWKH as well. And uh, during the week, he had his his blues show where he had people like uh, Johnny Otis and Lightning Hopkins and and Groovy's Boogie, Groovy's Boogie, yeah, and and even people like uh, Cab Calloway and Duke Ellington. You know, and, are we talking he's playing the records or they came in or what's going on? No, he played the records. But he, that's he cool. Played. What was his early 50s, man? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> like, uh, he was actually there from 48 till 54. Wow. What, what's your dad's name other than Groovy Boy? Ray Bartlett. Ray Bartlett. Ray Bartlett. Um, um, they, they 
did a, a big uh, PBS special on the Louisiana Hayride and, yeah. and uh, you know, chronicled all that. He was on there and they had a big 50 year reunion and he went back to the, the reunion and, and hung out with the, all the old Hayride guys that were oh, still man. around. Um, so your dad was there in the, in the studio when Hank Williams was there, when what, Elvis was there, you know, yeah. Cash Hank maybe. Williams, and, Hank Williams used to drop by the house occasionally you know, because my dad had a had a, a recording studio in the back of the house in the garage behind the house. Wow! And um, you know, I, I, my mom used to tell me the story of when I was a little kid. My dad had a band called the Boogie Masters, <laughs> and uh, they were playing in Marshall, Texas, which was not far from Shreveport. And I've got a big sign that says, you know, Groovy Boy and the Boogie Masters, and, and the sign says. White and colored welcome. Mm. So it's a nice mixed crowd there. And back in those days, that was that was you know really unheard of. And uh, one time he was playing out there, and and uh, Elvis was was back when Elvis was the king of the hillbillies. And my mom gave Elvis a ride out to the show in in our white Buick convertible with red leather interior, and and uh, wow. so since my mom was driving, he had to hold me in the car. <laughs> you were pretty I'm little, like, yeah. I'm like one year old. Yeah. Um, and he saw my dad and he said, um, gee, Mr. Bartlett, do you think I'll ever have a car like this? <laughs> <laughs> I reckon you've told that story a few times over the years. I have, I have. It's pre-Colonel Tom. Actually, yeah. Elvis asked my dad to manage him. There you go. And he was managing a guy named Slim Whitman at the time. Yeah. Have you ever wow. heard of Slim? He's from Tampa, I believe. wasn't wasn't Slim from? He was from Florida. I, I you believe know, I, that that rings a. a, a, a it, it, he was a yodeling guy, man. I guess, or maybe Jacksonville or something. But I think he was. My from dad turned yeah. Elvis down. He said, "You know, I'm too busy right now with uh, Slim." <sighs> and you know, he said, uh, "He said, you know, wouldn't have, wouldn't have been the same thing if he'd have managed Elvis, because Colonel Tom was a big part of Elvis's success." Yeah. You know, but Groovy Boy was, uh, I mean, I don't know if that was ahead of your time in, in you know, in, in early 50s Louisiana playing those, rec like, you know, the, the jazz records and R&B and stuff. How cool was that? You must have had a lot of, lot of friends, too. He did have a lot of friends. Yeah. Uh, and we had boxes and boxes of records. Yeah. And, and to, you know, at some point my mom threw them out. But, you know, when I was, you know, five, six, seven, up to about 12, you know, we had boxes of records of everybody from like uh, uh, the Platters and Clyde McFadder and, um, you know, uh, we had jazz records of, you know, when I was a kid, I, I really didn't know who, that just had a, like a cool cover. And I was like, oh, I love oh, the yeah. cover of this. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Is that where music kind of started for you? Is it that early? Like, yeah, something it was, resonated? Yeah. It was. Uh, my, my uncle uh, was married to a woman who taught accordion, and they started a, an accordion guitar school. And, um, you know, that's where I learned my first guitar chords. I learned out in the West Texas town of El Paso, beautiful, beautiful brown eyes and hang down your head, Tom Dooley. Oh, man. Hang down your head, Tom Dooley. <laughs> Amen. It stuck, too. <laughs> yeah, man, look at that look at that so you started playing as a, as a kid you started like hitting them chords when i was 11. so what were the 60s like for you oh the 60s were good they you remember were, the 60s they say if you remember the 60s you probably weren't there um <laughs> well you know it, I, I i sort of i started when i was 11 and i played some stuff i could play like the theme from have gun will travel and you mm -hmm. know um, um, some ventures kind of stuff, and but it kind of, kind of uh, went on the back burner. And then when I was about fourteen, and I realized that that the ladies went for the musicians. Oh, the old story. Yeah, of course. So, yeah, and then we like, wait, let's get a band, man. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, did the, was it the Beatles and the Stones and all that have an effect on you too? Is that a thing? It, it did, but you know, it, when I, I was can't playing, imagine playing Tom Dooley and getting the chicks though. That just doesn't work. Well, no, it, it was Tom Dooley was not a big El Paso. 
might have oh been. yeah works every time um uh, what a great thing I, I when i was 14 i lived in north little rock arkansas mm. you know so we we had like memphis you know we had a big blues kind of thing going on bb king came through town james brown came through town you know but at the same time we we i remember the first big concert i went to was a review at at the uh the um war memorial stadium which was a kind of a small stadium and the bands were the Yardbirds, herman and the hermits um paul revere and the raiders and and uh, you know wow some other band like that you know it was uh that was probably Jeff Beck era at Yardbirds. That's amazing. We were about out there, you know, right after that. It's like. That's, that's what stuck with you, right? <laughs> so, you know, and, you know, which, you know, in the old days, man, I like write a song for a girl, instant girlfriend. You know, these days I write a song for a girl, restraining order. <laughs> <laughs> good line, good line. So eventually, uh, and, and I know that probably a lot of folks here watching this know that you connected with Jimmy Buffett. Um, I'm going to say this was probably early, mid-70s. Ted, tell me how that happened, and then we'll take the story from there. Well, um, in 71, oh, I think, 72, something like that, I was in Nashville. Uh -huh. with uh, uh, an acoustic trio. We, we were called the Outlaw Brothers. And we were sort of like the band meets Crosby, Stills, and Nash. Oh, yeah. And uh, we opened for Jimmy at a club there called the Exit Inn. Oh, sure. I know it well. And, right. And, uh, I, I think we did, did you know, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, or, or Friday, Saturday, something like that. This was during that big first burst of somebody trying to make a star out of him on like Barnaby Records or something like that. I, you know, I, I didn't Early. Really know at the time. I just met him and then like, I don't know, a year or a year and a half later, I had gone to Austin, Texas with a guy named Bill Callery who wrote mm -hmm. some songs that Jerry Jeff recorded. Yeah. And, um, you know, I started doing, I was in, I went into my Django Reinhardt period. And, uh, you know, I wish I had one of those. To my song. So yeah. you know, we decided it was probably best that we go different ways. So <laughs> Bill was opening for Jimmy at a club there called Castle Creek. Mm. And I was playing in the band. I was playing bass and mandolin in Bill's band at the time. And so we did several nights there with Jimmy too. I don't know, you know, and, and, um, at, at some point, you know, backstage, in between shows, we were all backstage, and I went up to Jimmy, I said, you know, you need a guitar player, me. <laughs> and he said, well, I, I don't know if I got, you know, got money for it right now, but uh, he said, come up and sit in with me. And, and He was uh, just playing solo in those days. Yeah, yeah just yeah. playing solo. He said, come up and sit in, and uh, we'll see how it goes. So I went up there, and I watched his hand, yeah. You know, tried to follow the chords he was playing and tried to sing a little harmony, but I didn't know the words, so I was kind of like, yeah, but uh, we right. a dance with them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So the next thing I knew, we were playing the troubadour. Wow. Opening for Hoyt Axton. Do you know who Hoyt Axton is? Of course I do. Yeah. Uh, and and uh, I had played a gig in, in Austin. Uh, like the week before uh, at Castle Creek opening for Al Cooper. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that week that I was playing with Jimmy, I ran into Al at the Troubadour and he was like, didn't I just see you in Texas? <laughs> <laughs> what was it? You were duo. It was the two of you. How long did that go on? About a year and a half. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we, uh, we did some serious traveling, had some serious fun. Yeah. You know, at, right after the Troubadour, we did a tour with Three Dog Night, you know, through the Northeast. We flew wow. with them on their DC-3. <laughs> uh, Big the, time. We played the Music Hall in Boston. We played Bangor, Maine. We played Rochester, New York. And um, one other place, I, I can't remember, but I remember at the Music Hall in Boston, the, the promoter was came backstage and he was talking to Jimmy. He said, look, he said, 
the dog has to be on by nine o'clock. You got to get off the stage because the dog has to be on. The dog. We can't go up. We can't go over the stage hands. Make double time. The dog has to be on right. <laughs> Oh my God. And then you had the 20 minute version of God's own drunk. So there goes that. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it, there, in the early days, the, the, the Coral Reefer band was, was fictitious. It was, you know, Marvin Gardens and all of that stuff. So what That's changed right. was, was, you know, people were, I was going to say that, that I, his songwriting to me, especially in those, those early mid days was, was exemplary. I mean, my memory was that he kind of came out of that whole Jerry Jeff thing, like, oh, here's another guy who's very clever and very funny and could be very tender when he wants to be. When did it start to change? Now we can afford to have a whole band. And what brought that on? Well, you know, he could afford me, when, when I went to work for him, Come Monday was on the radio. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of what gave him the, the money to pay for me, for my plane tickets and my hotel rooms and my salary. Um, so, uh, you know, we, we were playing, we played a lot of gigs. We played a big circuit. Yeah. We played the, the Great Southeast Music Hall in Atlanta. We played uh, Passim's Coffee House in, in uh, uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts. We played The Bottom Line in New York. We played The Quiet Man or The Quiet Night in, in uh, Chicago. We played uh, The Boarding House in San Francisco and The Troubadour in, in uh, LA and, and, you know, we just kind of kept making a circuit and, and people started showing up, you know, he, but, but not in a big way. He, cause he didn't get a big radio yet. I mean, come Monday was like a top 40 thing. Yeah. Not, not like, um, um, Margaritaville. Yeah. Not like change your life big. Yeah. Right. Right. So, you know, we kept getting, getting uh, bigger gigs and bigger gigs and, and then, you know, at one point we played a gig, we played a festival in Oklahoma, an outdoor festival as a duo, an acoustic duo mm -hmm. to 135,000 people. Wow. You know, and at that point, I, I think he was, he was like, maybe we need a band. You know? <laughs> and, and I think we played, we played a place in Raleigh called, um, oh, the underground there. Um, can't think of the name. They, they're going to kill me about this too. Uh, <laughs> anyway, the club in Raleigh we played, I mean, that's, that's where it really gelled. And he said, Oh, you know, we got, there's too many people coming to the shows. You know, we got, we need a, a bigger band to, to, uh, you know, fill the room with sound. Kick know? it in second wind as it were. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, so, and, you know, you know, Harry Daly, of course, lived here for many years and I knew Harry uh, sort of peripherally, um, but so you got Harry and you got the drummer whose name I can never remember. Who's Phil Fajardo. Phil, yeah, yeah. So I mean, was that you know? I just saw on YouTube. There's some home movies of you guys like carousing and hijinks, <laughs> and acting acting stupid and being on stage. Look like I remember those days really well. It looked, looked like a lot of fun. Yeah, the yeah. early and that and fingers of course was there too. Yeah, yeah, it was a lot of fun. Consequently, I don't remember those days very well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Why am I not surprised? So you're on A1A. A1A is a pivotal record, absolutely pivotal record for Buffett. And that's really, as a Floridian, that, that was kind of when, and I was a bit younger, you know, I was 14 or something. That that's when he started coming on my radar. They said, Let's check out this guy. This is really unique. And then, of course, Havana Daydream was next which has just some great songs on it. Um, there were some great, I mean, on A1A, you know, that was the, the album with um, Pirate Looks at 40. Yeah. You know, and- I, so That's you playing the lead lines on that. Huh? That's you playing the lead lines on that. Oh, that's actually Reggie Young. I'm playing acoustic guitar. Oh, okay. Hello, Reggie. <laughs> that recording's gone around for a long time. Oh my God, Trying to Reason with Hurricane Season. Was that on that one? I was on that one. Yeah, all right. Yeah, boy. It's been a long I, time. I have a song on A1A called Dallas. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And um you know, I never I never recorded my own version of that song Dallas. until just recently and I just finished one and uh, I had it mastered at Abbey Road wow. and I'm going to release it probably next month. 
What's the song you have on the Rancho Deluxe soundtrack? You sing something on that one. I right? sing one song called, She Left Me a Nail to Drive. She stole my car and left me a nail to drive. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, like, I, I heard a story about that. And, uh, uh, it could be apocryphal. I don't know for sure. But the story I heard was that he was having trouble getting paid for that record. Yeah. And, and the record label had, had on, the, on the album listed that vocal that I sang as him. Mm -hmm. And he said, look, you know, unless you pay me, I'm going to sue because you're misrepresenting me here. You know, I didn't sing that song and you're, you listed it on there that, that it's oh. me. And um, so he got paid. Now, whether that's actually true or not, well, it was a cool couple of years, and 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 arguably, you know, somebody would argue with me that that was that was up uh, to me. Changes in latitudes. This is me personally. Was the last great Buffett record. I mean, you know, and you're on in this shelter. I'm assuming that was that maybe recorded for the previous album. I mean, you you left the band at some point. I did leave the band. Yeah. You know, ostensibly to to do my own music but really i think the reason was that i was about to spontaneously combust and um uh, too, too many good times and oh my god you know, <laughs> and, and uh, you know i think i think my subconscious was saying you know you better bail you know before you go up and smoke so you know i left the band and then then i went out and replaced the guys that replaced me a couple of times for the the uh, Changes in Latitudes album, the guy who mm -hmm. replaced me uh, had a drug problem and, and got arrested. And uh, while they were doing the record. Oh boy. So they call me up to, hey, can you fly down here and finish the record? <laughs> that, okay, so that makes I sense. Said, Absolutely not, absolutely. <laughs> I said, no, I'll be right there. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Well, I mean, so you sort of, it wasn't a bitter thing like, Screw you, pal, get out of here. And yeah, that's nice. It's always nice to hear. Were you surprised that he went on to... In fact, he gave me a Rolex watch. So that? <laughs> Were you surprised that he went on to sort of icon status and all of that, and, and a brand and, you know, huge? Because he was just cool in the beginning, but then it kind of went stratospheric later. Um, surprised. I guess, you know, to a certain extent, you know, I was surprised, but, but you know, he's a very smart guy and um, he was always good with his business, you know, he, yeah. he never lived, he lived off of his road money, put all of his publishing money back, you know, had great accounting and a good accounting firm to watch over his business, yeah. not his, not his, his uh, uncle or, you know, the CPA or something so that, right. He wasn't like Billy Joel, where one day he turned up and there was no money in the bank. Nothing there, right, right. You know, um, very smart guy, and, and you know, he, he just toured relentlessly. You know, that was the thing that kept him going, was, was touring, and he tried to adapt to the musical styles. You know, I mean, if you see videos of him from the 80s, he's got a skinny tie on, and he's, mm. you know, I mean, you know, trying, to, trying to at least appear new wavy you know when you think of new wave you know new wave encompassed everybody from the flock of seagulls to huey lewis so yeah you know it's really just a marketing tool you know not but he's really still going out there he's got a zillion dollars in the bank and he's a he's a brand he is know. a brand yeah you know and i think that just sort of you know you, you, you gotta when you get an opportunity you gotta seize it and and an opportunity sort of came to him yeah. And he got the right guys to come help him manage it. And, um, you know, very smart guy. You know, one of the great things about working for him is I'm a big reader, you know. I, I always have a book. Mm -hmm. And when I was with him, he always had a book. Right. And he, he's, he turned me on to Larry McMurtry and Jim Harrison and, and uh, you know, a zillion writers. You know, he loved to hang out with writers. Yeah. You know, I can remember going out to uh, Shel Silverstein's houseboat in Sausalito when we, we went out and did a radio show at the record plant in Sausalito. And then after that or before that, we went down to Shell's houseboat uh -huh. and 
and hung around. And I can see how they would have got along. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So tell me about Fool for tell me tell me about Fool for Blonde because I'm going to tell you that I've never seen Texas Chainsaw Massacre and <laughs> I, and I never will because that's just not my thing. But if if you don't know, folks, uh, our friend Roger has a song that is prominently featured in in that classic film. Um, is that is that just a, a record you made and and they said we like? I mean, you weren't really associated with the movie; they just used your song in it. Is that right? Right. Yeah. Well, what happened was the the uh, the director Toby Hooper. Yeah. He was a film student at the University of Texas in Austin, and I had recorded that song, you know, at a studio called The Hill on the Moon, run by a guy named Jim Enman, mm -hmm. who was the brother of John Enman, who was the guitar player for Jerry Jeff. Okay back in those days. Yeah. And uh, Toby Hoover was, went to all the recording studios in the area looking for songs uh, that he could put in the movie and heard Fool for a Blonde and identified it with the he, the heroine in the movie is a blonde, Sally, you know, and uh, he said, oh, you know, he oh, there you is, go. is the guys being a fool for Sally. So he put it in the movie and the movie kind of, kind of, you know, languished i mean it was a grindhouse movie you know what a grindhouse movie oh is? yeah yeah yeah, uh, yeah you know when i when i lived in new york city and, and 42nd street was still really dingy and 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 funky i went by a movie theater there and there was a poster up and they were showing the texas chainsaw massacre and i was like oh my god look my name's on broadway <laughs> <laughs> hey i'll take what i can get man uh <laughs> But, what but, brought you to St. Petersburg, and, and when was that? Uh, I've been down here for just about two years now. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the, the, the music scene in New York City is, is you know, dead or dying. You know, there's, there's all the middle class musician jobs are gone. All the studio jobs just about are gone. I mean, there used to be a, a huge recording business there and jingle business tv film you know recording and and uh you know that the jingle business sort of cratered in the in the, the late 80s and the early 90s and you know all the clubs are the the you're going to be famous if you play here kind of club we don't pay you and bring all your friends <laughs> and buy them beer yeah so you just had enough of that stuff I got an email from a club that said, oh, we'd love, we want to be the premier music uh, venue in New York, and we'd love for you to play here. And I said, well, how much do you pay? Do you advertise? And do you have any kind of built-in crowd? And they said, well, we pay, you know, we charge $5 at the door, and we take the first $100. And uh, uh, then after that, we split it 50-50. No, we don't have a built-in crowd and advertising is your responsibility and i was like oh i can't wait to play there <laughs> oh man yeah do it do it for the experience so you came to saint i mean why saint pete though you been I have a down here named pete merrigan oh yeah he's been on the show before sure i i came down to visit him down here and saint pete was really great and and uh you know the all the time i lived in new york city i really never tried to uh get involved in the parrot head kind of scene because yeah. the, the style of music that I was doing up there was very blues and and rock with a little jazzy thing kind of thrown in and and I didn't realize that trop rock was was not a musical genre it was a lyrical genre uh -huh. you know because you got everybody from Sonny Jim to Donnie Brewer to John Patty you know, to John Frenzy, to, you know, all these, all these guys, you know, play totally different kind of music, you know, but mm -hmm. the, the lyrical content is similar in some yeah. way, you know, so I like St. Pete and, and uh, even though I love Manhattan and, and I would stay there if, if I was a billionaire, you know. Uh, That'd be the only way I could do it. Yeah. Yeah. It yeah. was, I, I, I had a really great apartment there for a while. And then I got married, and when I got divorced, I lost the great apartment. So uh, 
you know, I had downsized. <laughs> right. By necessity. I was like, well, maybe it's time for me to move along. So I love it down here. It's really great. So you you play a lot of local gigs. I mean, you, you play gigs around here and stuff. Or, uh, yeah. Well, not in the last couple of months, I'm guessing. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No. Well, let's tell folks about, um, we're just about out of time, but let's, let's tell folks, you, your website is rogerbartlett.com. Right. And, uh, and you're putting out new music all the time, as you said. I'm working on a new album right now. Cool. There you go. And so we can hear your stuff, and you've got some videos, too. I saw some session you did the other day with Zinzi and a couple of other guys. It was real cool. I don't know if it was in that very room. It was in this very room. It was, that was real cool. And, you know, and so I, I look forward to seeing you. Well, you want to take us out with one more tune, Roger? You got okay. something? Sure. sure. Fool for a blonde, maybe? All right. <laughs> it up one more time. All right. Think about too many things. Spend most every day in a sidewalk cafe, drinking coffee, watching women walking by. The color of their hair not the reason that I stare, but I always was a fool or blind. Sitting in the sun, the ladies pass. I watch their last goodbye. When I catch their eye, I smile and say, "You." And they play as they strut along the way down by the cafe and beyond the shimmering lights, not what brings the buzz, but I always be a fool for a blunt.
Hi, Roger Bartlett. You are Groovy Boy Jr. <laughs> Thank you, my friend. You know, I, I've, as I said, I've never seen the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, uh, and so I can't even imagine how that song plays into it, but... It's, I, it's on the radio. They, they pick up a hitchhiker. The, 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 the group of college students pick up a hitchhiker who's one of these serial killers, and it's on the radio while okay. he, he takes out a razor and slashes his own hand and then okay. he slashes a guy. <laughs> okay, let's, yeah, let's leave it there. Hey man, absolute pleasure. Thank you, Roger Bartlett. And um, we'll great see you on the other side of everything, okay? Okay, great. Take, take care, my friend.